Hello and welcome today. Uh, thanks for joining everyone from all over the world. I won't say good morning or good afternoon uh, since I think we've got people from every time zone in the world present today. Um, my name is Will McDermott. I'm a program manager at DCAF, uh, the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, uh, where for a few years now we've been working on uh, building better linkages between security sector governance and sustainable developments, uh, which is uh, what brings us to organize this event today uh, that we've uh, co-organized with uh, UPR Info and uh, WUFUNA, the World Federation of United Nations Associations. Uh, we have an exciting roundtable uh, discussion planned for you today uh, to watch, learn from, and uh, possibly contribute to yourselves. Uh, though the formats um, might be a bit different to other virtual events you've attended before. Uh, we all know that Zoom fatigue is very real, and so we've put together something that we hope will be engaging uh, uh, for those with something specific to contribute to the discussion, uh, but rewarding for many of you um, uh, present who might only be loosely uh, familiar with the subject matter, but still keenly interested in learning more, but in a bit more passive way. Uh, therefore, uh, we have two groups present today. Uh, I'd ask you to imagine that we're sitting in a room uh, and uh, a physical room rather than this virtual room. Um, and uh, maybe think about the UN Security Council uh, chamber, where you have a large circle table in the middle uh, at which our impressive cast of experts will sit around and uh, will soon discuss the topic at hand today. And just beyond the circle table in the middle, we have um, uh, a number of seats and uh, chairs just outside of the circle uh, where all the aides and first secretaries and sit in the Security Council. Uh, there's the much larger audience, which is many of you in attendance who've just joined us, um, where uh, you can watch the discussion unfold today. Uh, except unlike the Security Council, uh, those of you who aren't seated at the table will have a chance to sort of chime into the discussion and contribute and share uh, your thoughts and experiences, um, uh, which is largely uh, through the chat feature. So please do make use of the chat feature. You can access it by clicking the button chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you do have any questions, comments, relevant resources, please submit them through the chat and we'll try and incorporate them into the uh, agenda today. Uh, we're also recording the session today, though those of you who are in this outer ring, those of you who are in attendance will not be visible in the recording, just those experts who are sort of seated around the inner table today. Um, the topic that we're discussing today uh, is really at the heart of what Geneva Peace Week is all about. Uh, with the inaugural Kofi Annan Geneva Peace Address, which will be held on Thursday, uh, it's all the more appropriate that we use his own words. Uh, 16 years ago, he said, we will not enjoy development without security. We will not enjoy security without development, and we will not enjoy either without respect for human rights. Uh, this year's theme at uh, Geneva Peace Week is about building systems of peace in order to weather challenges to peace. And in the 16 years since Kofi Annan made these remarks, uh, we have built many new systems of peace. Uh, in particular, the sustainable development goals, especially through goal 16 and its aspiration to promote peaceful societies and the Human Rights Council and its universal periodic review. Uh, what we want to explore today is how to improve these systems. And we think that Geneva Peace Week is a great space to have this discussion, bringing together the hub of expertise centered in Geneva uh, on human rights with an emerging and rapidly developing body of expertise on peace and sustainable developments. Uh, for these experts to get together and share their experiences, learn from one another and apply these lessons to their own systems of reporting, whether it be human rights or sustainable developments. Uh, we are well aware that many of you, including the experts here, are not familiar with both these sectors particularly the reporting processes involved. So we've developed a quiz to engage everyone and give you a quick primer on both of these systems. Uh, this also gives me the chance to say that, to reiterate, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, in addition to my, my organization, DCAF, we also have um, uh, Wufuna uh, and uh, UPR Info uh, here, who've been an instrumental in organizing this workshop. Uh, and bringing together some of the experts within their networks uh, uh, around this table today. 
So Emma Hunt from Wafuna will lead you through the quiz on the SDGs and its voluntary national review or the VNRs uh, part, which will then be followed by Nicoletta Zapile from UPR Info to handle the UPR process. I'll now hand the floor and or the screen to Emma. Please go ahead. Thanks, Will, and hello, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here with you all today for this exciting webinar. Um, as Will mentioned, I'm going to be kicking us off uh, today, uh, starting a bit of a quiz. We just thought it would be a good way to kind of refresh everybody's memory on the VNR and UPR process before we dive into the more substantive discussion. Uh, we'll be running the quiz on Mentimeter. So there's a couple of options up on the screen now uh, to help you access that. Um, if you have the app, that's fantastic. Log in, you can just enter the code 25572677, and that should take you to the quiz. Otherwise, you can scan the QR code on the right of your screen or go to www.menti.com uh, and then enter the same code. And once you're in uh, the quiz, just feel free to answer the questions as we move through them on the screen. Um, just a quick note to the other speakers, uh, please feel free to join in on this exercise as well, as Will mentioned. Um, and if there are any difficulties at all with jumping uh, on Mentimeter, please just put your questions in the chat and one of the team will do our best to help you out. Um, Will, was there any other way you wanted me to mention in terms of how people are able to join? Nope, that, that was perfect. Fantastic. Okay, so while I am just giving people a couple of minutes to jump onto Mentimeter, I'll just start by giving a really high level overview of the VNR process and then um, we have five questions about how it works to follow. So as I'm sure many of you know, the VNR process is the sort of review or follow up mechanism for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It aims to promote um, sort of accountability around implementation of the agenda and sort of create a space for knowledge sharing um, and best practice, uh, sharing best practice and lessons learned around implementation. Uh, the VNR consists of a written report and a presentation at the High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, which is held in July each year. And the HLPF provides a political guidance on implementation of the agenda as a whole, choosing a specific theme and a number of SDGs to focus on or sustainable development goals to focus on um, at each uh, forum. So that brings us to our first question today, uh, which is who can submit a VNR? So these are uh, questions which are focused much more around the process of the VNR uh, than the SDGs. So we have only states, only civil society, states, civil society and UN bodies. And thank you for the people who have jumped in already to start answering the questions, that's fantastic. I'll just give people a couple more seconds uh, to put their, their thoughts down in the app. Okay, so look, I might um, kind of jump in and, and start to answer this one now, but the answer to who can submit a voluntary national review or a VNR is option A, only states. So while other actors, including non-state actors, might have the opportunity to contribute to the VNR, the sort of review process uh, and the presentation at that high-level political forum uh, is led by member states. Okay, so let's jump into the second question which is how often must states submit a VNR? Is it every year, every four years? Or option C, there is no requirement to submit a VNR. Okay, well, look, it looks like um, a lot of people are, are pretty confident about this response. So I will jump in again. Um, and it is again option C. So as the name suggests, the voluntary national reviews um, are voluntary. There's no requirement on a state to submit a VNR at the HLPF. Um, the HLPF and uh, Secretary General has encouraged member states to submit at least two VNRs uh, in the course of the 2030 agenda. Um, however, uh, as I mentioned, there's no requirement. Um, but for your information, in 2021, 44 member states submitted a VNR, 10 for the first time, 24 for the second time, and 10 for the third time. Okay, 
The next question that we have is what is the intended content of a VNR? Is it good practices, gaps and lessons learned implementing the 2030 agenda as a whole or progress on implementation of the specific SDGs which are being reviewed at the HLPF? So I'll just give people a couple of minutes to answer this one. Okay, so I'll jump in and answer this one now. The answer to this is actually good practices, gaps and lessons learned implementing the 2030 agenda as a whole. So um, the 2030 agenda, I mean, sorry, the VNRs are intended to look beyond necessarily the SDGs which are being reviewed at the HLPF and encapsulate a state's uh, implementation of the 2030 agenda as a whole, including achievements, challenges, and gaps in implementation. Um, this can include things like um, reporting on the incorporation of the goals into national frameworks, how the economic, uh, social, and environmental dimensions of development um, are being implemented, and then progress against each of the SDGs, including um, those that are not being reviewed at the, at the particular HLPF. Um, also, obviously, of worth noting is that each of the Sustainable Development Goals is accompanied by a series of targets and indicators, and states are encouraged to report against these um, in their VNR process. Okay, moving on to our second last question. Uh, what does the 2030 agenda encourage states to include in the VNR? Is it diverse stakeholder perspectives, rigorous data analysis, or focused on those left further behind, furthest behind, or all of the above? And again, I'll just pause for a moment while people jump in and answer this one. Okay, so um, a lot of people have also uh, got this one correct. So it is the fourth answer, all of the above. So VNRs uh, are led kind of by uh, a sort of driven at the country level and led by national contexts and priorities. Um, but there is some guidance given in the 2030 agenda about what states can include. Um, and this includes um, a sort of comment that VNRs should be inclusive and voluntary and include diverse stakeholder perspectives, including the perspectives of Indigenous peoples, civil society and the private sector. States are encouraged to submit reviews which are rigorous and based on data analysis conducted through national level reviews and evaluations sort of over the course of the years between um, high level political forums. Um, Reviews should also be um, sort of gender sensitive, respectful of human rights and have a focus on those left furthest behind. Um, and as I mentioned, states are encouraged to sort of track all of these things throughout the course of the year through a series of um, kind of national level reviews and evaluations to feed into their voluntary national reviews at the HLPF. Okay, and on to our last question, uh, which is more of a statement with a true, false or I don't know but the VNR process contains follow-up mechanisms for implementation of the SDGs. True, false, or are we unsure? Okay, great. Well, look, I think um, this is another really interesting one um, with a little bit of a differing uh, of opinion. So I will jump in now. Um, but sort of look, what we've said is that there are follow up mechanisms that exist, but they're not mandatory. So after the HLPF, the Secretariat will prepare a report, a synthesis report containing sort of best practices and lessons learned from the HLPF. Um, member states are encouraged to draw on those lessons in their implementation of the 2030 agenda and the SDGs, um, and also sort of kind of continue to report back um, on those sort of key takeaways and lessons learned uh, in future uh, VNRs and HLPFs. Um, and non-state actors such as civil society also have the opportunity to take the data from that report and sort of the 
the um, sort of communications at the high level political forum and use that um, in sort of advocacy um, and sort of discussions with member states around implementation of the 2030 agenda. So I think as we we'll mentioned before, um, there are sort of some follow-up mechanisms to complete the circle, um, but they're not sort of mandatory mechanisms um, in that sense. But uh, that's all we have with the VNR process. So thanks very much everyone for uh, participating. I am now going to hand over to Nicoletta who will lead us through the quiz as it relates to the UPR process. Thank you very much, Emma, and hello to everyone. We will go through the same process with the Universal Periodic Preview. We have five questions for you, and through these five questions, we will try to, let's say, build a small introduction or general overview on the Universal Periodic Review for those that maybe are not that familiar with the mechanism. And I see that you're very interactive and uh, super <laughs> are participating in the quiz, so that's very good. I'll just read out the question, the first question, um, to describe a bit what is the Universal Periodic Review, uh, consists in how often is a country reviewed through this process? So while you are replying to this question, I just want to give, let's say, a broad definition of uh, the Universal Periodic Review, which is a, a state-driven peer review process um, on the human rights situation of each country. And one of the elements that makes this mechanism very unique, this human rights mechanism very unique, is the element of its periodicity. And I see that many of you have um, uh, chosen the right, selected the right answer. And it's true that um, every country uh, is reviewed every four years and a half. This means that uh, a cycle to be concluded um, lasts four years and a half. And up to now, this is uh, uh, the human rights mechanism through which all the countries, the 193 UN member states, have been uh, reviewed up to now. But let's go with the second question uh, to find and uh, describe a bit more uh, this uh, mechanism. Uh, what are, according to you, the human rights issues uh, that can be covered uh, within the UPR mechanism. So you have uh, different options here. You have civil and political rights. You have the option on economic rights. You have uh, uh, only the right of education, or uh, you have instead a more general option from civil, political rights, and economic, social, and cultural rights. And it's very nice to see that there are no doubts on this, uh, or at least almost no doubts. And it's true that the right answer is that uh, the other uh, element that makes this mechanism uh, unique is the universality of the human rights topics that can be addressed through this mechanism. It's true that through this mechanism, um, states can make recommendations to other states on freedom uh, of opinion to the access to water and sanitation, from access uh, the right of housing to um, uh, uh, asking, recommending another state to abolish death penalty. So really, it's a variety of uh, human rights because the basis um, is uh, the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as all of the treaties, uh, protocols, and conventions that the uh, state under review has ratified. So through this mechanism, we can monitor the um, obligations, the state obligations, uh, upon the basis of these sources that I have just um, listed. But let's go and find out some more details and see um, what is another characteristic of uh, the Universal Periodic Review that makes it special if we compare it to other mechanisms or to the VNR mechanism. And that is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, concerns about the participation of the stakeholders to the UPR. We have said that it's a state-driven peer review process. But the question I'm asking now is who can submit a report to the Universal Periodic Preview? So you have three options for the moment, uh, only states. Uh, the second option is only civil society members. And the third option is uh, state, civil society, and UN bodies. And this, uh, again, 
I, I repeat the fact that it's a unique mechanism because it's, it really is, and it allows the participation of different stakeholders. Uh, in fact, um, the, um, uh, through the UPR, uh, not only states, the states under review can submit a national report addressing the human rights situation in their own country, but this information can be complemented by other two uh, very relevant uh, sources of information, which consist in a compilation of the report of UN bodies and special procedures, as well as what is defined the other stakeholders report, uh, which is um, a summary that is compiled by the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights, which includes these missions from uh, civil society organizations, NGOs, associations, all the members, all the civil society that can uh, provide an overview uh, of the human rights situation in their own country and complement like this the information provided in the national reports. These three documents, these three reports are the basis of the UPR uh, through which the recommending states can get the information to formulate the recommendations. But now we go ahead with uh, um, the second last question that is more a true and false actually, rather than a question. Um, so, the, the statement is, states are encouraged to report on the recommendations received in the previous UPR cycle. Is this inference statement true or false? Let's see, let's give a bit of time to this question. I see that there are some uncertainty risks if we compare it to the <laughs> reactivity of the others. Questions? Okay. So it's true. Uh, why uh, is this important? Because really the UPR needs to be conceived as a process. It's not only the moment of the review, the moment in which the states are reviewed every four years and a half, uh, this review that happens here in Geneva, but it's actually a process that builds uh, on the previous cycle. So the mechanism also, um, which has the aim of promoting human rights, to share good practices, but is also a mechanism that is useful to monitor the human rights situation in a country. And so it's important to uh, report on the recommendations that the state has received in the previous cycle. And to conclude, we have the last um, statement, true or false also, um, that states uh, that the UPR has a follow-up mechanism for the implementation of UPR recommendations. This is a bit a tricky question. Um, so I'll give you just a couple of seconds uh, more to uh, reply. It's quite tricky because um, the UPR um, does not have an, let's say, an international follow-up mechanism that monitors uh, all the UPR recommendations. The uh, follow-up of the UPR recommendations relies on the responsibility of the states, as well as also on the responsibility of the other national stakeholders. Um, as I hope that we'll see from the debate that the conversation that we will have with the different experts here, um, states have been putting in place a national mechanism for reporting and follow-up to facilitate the reporting and the monitoring of UPR recommendations. And this helps uh, to um, ensure the accountability on the human rights obligations that the state has um, taken. So now I would like to thank you all for your incredible participation to this uh, uh, small quiz that we have prepared that helped us to, let's say, give an overview both on the VNR process and the UPR process. And I leave it to Will to facilitate the conversations with the experts. Thanks very much, Emma and Nicoletta, for the quiz. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I also myself learned quite a bit and was wrong on a few of those questions. So it's enlightening for me as well. Um, just based on that, it seems that we have a bit more uh, expertise on the human rights side of things. I saw that the responses were maybe, uh, there was a bit more uh, unanimity on, on those than on the, the SDG and the VNR side. So uh, it's interesting that maybe we have a bit more expertise, though understandably, on the human rights sector, given its sort of 
intrinsic connection with Geneva. Um, so as Nicoletta mentioned, we'll now move on to uh, the discussion today. Uh, we've assembled an impressive group of experts here. Uh, on the slide that is now being shared, you can see uh, those those experts and, and their organizations. Uh, you can also see them in tiled on your screen as well. Uh, and you'll hear from each of them today. Uh, the majority of the experts present are representatives of civil society. Uh, we focused on civil society largely because these two processes, uh, both the VNRs and UPR, are, are largely state-led processes. However, uh, uh, the, the uh, UPR process has uh, a sort of more inclusive nature to it than the VNR process. Uh, and so what we're hoping, hoping to uh, look at today is how, um, if there's any lessons that can be applied from one process to another, uh, particularly from the UPR process to the VNRs, uh, and see if there's even opportunities for cooperation or sort of building synergies between the two processes. Uh, and we're hoping, um, uh, yeah, but as we've seen, uh, the, the UPR process is has built in uh, much more stronger inclusive components to sort of consult with the wider uh, uh, breadth of stakeholders than, than the VNRs. Uh, though peppered in amongst the representatives of civil society are a few experts from international organizations and state institutions who are also critical allies to assist CSOs in these processes uh, and create opportunities for greater participation uh, and amplifying their voices within the processes. Um, and so it's this issue about how uh, we can improve civil society participation in both of the processes and see what lessons can be learned from both. Um, uh, ultimately, both processes seek to create an increasingly human-centered approaches to human rights, peace, and development, uh, which create this so-called uh, triple nexus as well. Uh, we have a lot to discuss today uh, to follow. Uh, and uh, the way we will roughly structure the discussion, though it is ultimately a discussion, so it may evolve in different ways than we had sort of planned, and we'll be interested to see how that, that goes. But we've structured it according to um, a, a sort of rough uh, comparison of the reporting cycles for both the two processes. And then we will sort of compare and contrast the different approaches and other different uh, sort of practical uh, um, uh, examples on how CSOs uh, can sort of provide entry points into these different stages. The first stage is the sort of before the review process. So uh, this is um, before a state has uh, sort of committed to the review, um, whether that is the universal periodic review or the voluntary national review. Um, with the voluntary national review, it's voluntary. So these cycles can sort of have different periods of time, whereas the UPR process is much more systematic. Not every four and a half years, you, you know when the next review will occur, which isn't the case with the VNRs. Uh, the second stage is during the review itself. So once uh, once the, uh, the state in question ha has begun the review and has begun consulting with these different stakeholders, uh, we will then look at this and see what are the different entry points at this stage then before the review. What can CSOs do to feed directly into the review uh, and what mechanisms are available at their disposal to, to contribute to that. The next stage um, is a bit narrower than the previous two, and we'll, we'll allocate a little bit more time to these two first stages, given that they have uh, perhaps the most information uh, to say there. Um, uh, the next, the third stage is uh, between the, re the country's review and before its presentation at the high-level conference. In For the UPRs, this is at the, the Human Rights Council, and for the VNRs, this is at the high-level political forum. Uh, this stage is, can be relatively short, but still prevents some unique opportunities for CSOs to engage and influence the agenda and ensure that their voices are being heard. Uh, and then the final stage is at this high level conference itself at the Human Rights Council or the HLPF. And here there's also some interesting opportunities for CSOs to engage and get their message out there. Uh, and so while I call that the the fourth and final stage. Ultimately, uh, this is a cycle. It's a circle where, uh, where the final stage then cycles back to the beginning of the next stage, which is the pre-review stage. So within this, there's a sort of ambiguity of when, 
one cycle ends and the next begins because part of it is part of built into this cycle is that the lessons, the recommendations and the findings of the first cycle are inherently sort of built back into the next stage where you begin the pre-review cycle. So I'd encourage the experts present to sort of capture this sort of post review points into either the first stage or at the final stage as it sort of is a bit of a gray area at which point it sort of fits in best. Um, and then I'd also encourage uh, the experts to consider thinking about through the lens of the five functions that, that we at DCAF have identified that CSOs can serve. These five functions are awareness raising um, uh, by bringing the attention to certain issues, advocacy, which is then once there is this awareness of sort of advocating for action on these this, this newfound awareness, uh, monitoring and oversight, so uh, sort of following up on commitments of the state um, to make sure that they sort of uh, are held accountable to these commitments that they've pledged. Uh, the research and analysis function, so collecting the data and information to inform these reviews, uh, but also service provision and often delivering um, the services that the state would normally provide, uh, though this one is maybe a bit rarer. Um, and to the experts around the table, um, I just a few uh, technical instructions. But um, when you would like to jump in, I'd ask you to click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen uh, so I can know to call on you. Uh, though I will also make use of my moderator privileges to uh, pick on you. And I may uh, call on you uh, uh, unrequested to, to chime into these uh, different stages. Um, also, to ensure that we have uh, sufficient time for everyone to contribute, um, I'll be asking speakers to limit their remarks to a maximum of two minutes. So at the two minute mark, uh, you will hear a bell sound, which uh, my colleague will play. You'll hear that. That should be hopefully loud enough and jarring enough to uh, uh, trigger you to sort of wrap up your comments. But if you don't, I may interrupt and, uh, and ask you again to wrap up your remarks just so we have sufficient time for everyone to get their inputs in there. So without further ado, uh, let's get started on the discussion. Uh, so the first stage, as I mentioned, is the, the sort of before the review process stage. Uh, within this, uh, we'll start first with an overview, at, with a look at the UPR process. I think there's a larger body of evidence on this, and maybe some good practices that could be applied to the the VNR process. And so, uh, if any of the speakers have want to jump in and be the first, I'd appreciate that. But if not, um, maybe I would call on Johnny uh, 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 Magazani uh, to perhaps share some uh, insights into this stage. I know, Johnny, you have to leave a bit early, so I also want to give you a chance to chime into this. Can you share any ex ex your experience working, especially for OHCHR, in assisting with this review, uh, the, the UPR process, about different ways in which um, in which CSOs can can feed into this pre-review process. What are the different entry points for them there? Please, Johnny. Thank you, and uh, very pleased to be here and share some of what we are learning through this uh, fantastic uh, universal mechanism of the Council, which has been created in 2006, has become operation in 2008, and now we are in the towards the end of the third cycle with 171 states reviewed as of this morning in Samoa. We'll have Hungary this afternoon in the UPR working group. I think Nicoletta has already said a great deal. And I would like perhaps to say upfront that the role of a civil society organization and national human rights institution is critical in the whole process of this review. Yes, it's a peer review state to state, but informed by the great submissions that are made by civil society organization, national human rights institution, regional human rights mechanism, wherever available, as well as uh, UN entities such as treaty bodies, special procedures mandate, and the UN system as a whole. So when states provide recommendation, the state under review, they have a body of knowledge, which is very precise, very local, and which of course increasingly depends on the quality of the information and its timeliness vis-a-vis -vis critical challenges at country level when it comes to 
implementation of human rights obligations and or commitments made in previous cycle of the UPL. I have to say that uh, the contribution, the main contribution is through submission for the summary of stakeholders report, which we prepare for every single state review. But I would also emphasize that uh, as was indicated, the role of civil society is before, during, including with the ability of civil society to address the council during the item six discussion, during the adoption of the PR outcome. And then especially afterwards, when we focus on implementation and follow-up, and the third cycle of the UPR is indeed focused on implementation and follow-up. Over to you. Thanks, Johnny, for that. And yeah, just a reminder, the, the bell will be chiming. So I think we'll hear it uh, quite a few times. Two minutes is a lot shorter than you think. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks for that, that comment. Uh, and I think it's a really quite fundamental difference between this UPR process and the VNR process, of which you mentioned that that civil society engagement is before, during, after, uh, which which is really interesting. It's very innovative, uh, but it's maybe not the case with uh, the, the VNR process, which we'll get to in just a second. Um, but uh, maybe I could call on one of the other um, UPR experts, uh, um, Milun, maybe you could share your insight into uh, into this sort of implementing recommendations and incorporating past lessons into the sort of before phase, uh, and also what role do CSOs have in in engaging in these processes in addition to what Johnny already mentioned? Well, yeah, thanks very much, uh, and hello everyone. Um, I think that uh, I mean what I've seen over the last years working on the UPR is uh, the tremendous. Um, increase in civil society activity at the national level because of the UPR on human rights. We have so many countries where you have national alliances of uh, NGOs that have come together to feed into the UPR and you have much more partnership happening now between NGOs, NHRIs, NGOs, uh, governments, uh, there's involvement of the parliaments, there's more and more academic bodies that are contributing to the process and it, it's actually really increased the level of Human rights education at the at the national level, and uh, and I think that has really helped to galvanize much more activity, including the UN country teams that were previously not so active on on human rights are now because they have to themselves prepare a, a UN country team report. So I think overall there's been a you know a much more engagement uh, with civil society. We've also seen I've seen in many countries where NGOs are also helping each other. So it has helped to strengthen the rest of the human rights mechanism process, whether it's the treaty bodies or the work of the special rapporteurs. Uh, so I think there's a there's a fundamental difference. I think one of the issues we really need to point out is, the, is how concrete the UPR is, because it's, it's really based on specific uh, international human rights and humanitarian instruments. Uh, it's not, I find the SDG process um, in comparison, quite fluffy, if I can use that word. Um, and, and I think that that specificity that the UPR brings, where governments are not really allowed to deviate from that, uh, in addition to the periodicity and the strict compliance with the timetables, I think all of these make the UPR a much more robust process than, uh, than the SDGs. Thanks. Thanks, Milun. Yeah, um, I, I, I would tend to agree that there is this level of specificity that is, yeah, perhaps a bit uh, stronger language as well that, you know, it doesn't recommend, but it sort of mandates. Um, uh, maybe uh, I can ask um, from uh, uh, John Robert, perhaps you could uh, chime in uh, about your experience in feeding into the UPR process before this sort of review has taken. What have, what have you done in, in Uganda to sort of uh, contribute to, uh, to it, this phase of the pre-review process? Oh, well, thank you so much, Will. I, I, I really want to appreciate uh, being part of this engagement. Yes, I'm John Robert Riachera from Uganda. Yes, as, as the, the previous speaker said, uh, what has happened here in Uganda is that we have 
uh, constituted ourselves into uh, you know what you can call the national stakeholders forum and uh, indeed all the CSOs uh, civil society organizations we are under a coalition which is the national coalition for human rights defenders and we have been undertaking this process pushing uh, reaching out to the grassroots the grassroots uh, the civil society organizations at the grassroots looking at inclusiveness looking at reaching out person on the, on, on the ground. And that has been a very good thing. Sorry, John Robert, uh, you're, you're breaking up a bit. For example, uh, when your connection is the, a bit uh, more stable, we'll come back to you. Foreign affairs, we've been working together with uh, ocean affairs. Sorry about that. Uh, we'll come back to John Robert in a second. Um, I think his sound is, is catching up. Yeah. And, and of course, also the UN, uh, the UN team, country team has been very, very helpful. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, John Robert. We'll come back to you in just a second, maybe when your connection is a little bit more stable. But I'll go to Alice's uh, story uh, next. Please, Alice, do you want to chime in? Thank you, Will. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you to the three organisations who've put this together today. Um, it's a great event and I'm learning a lot about um, the BNRs in particular. Um, so just building on sort of what's already been said, um, I lead what's called the UPR project at BCU and we're an academic stakeholder to the UPR. Um, and so one way that we engage with the UPR is through submitting those stakeholder reports that have already been mentioned. Um, and we do that based on the academic research that we're already conducting. Um, so we're already doing this research um, and we raise the, the attention of particular issues in countries all across the world. So. For example, uh, women's rights, capital punishment, freedom of religion that a number of us in the law school at BCU are conducting. Um, now, in a way, this is a challenge, actually, because apart from um, we're currently writing a report for the UK, apart from in the UK, we aren't actually on the ground. Um, so we don't have that on the ground um, uh, insight um, and data collection. And so we make our um, submission based upon academic research uh, most of the time. It's very much desk research. Um, but, but we have had good traction so far. So all of the reports that we have submitted have been cited um, by the OHCHR, the Officer, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, Stakeholder Summary Report. Um, and a, a way that, um, and I know that there are other um, academics, I can see um, that Damien's here from the University of Stirling. It's a really nice way of our academic research not to just sit behind a paywall of an academic journal and not really, you know, not have some actual impact in practice. Um, and I'm certainly a big advocate for other um, academics to get involved within the UPR or the VNRs in, in any way that they can and use their academic research really to, to actually try and make a difference on the ground. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Alice. That's a great contribution and a reminder that academia is part of civil society uh, and that there is a great wealth of knowledge that often maybe doesn't feed into some of these like policy, dis international policy level discussions like the uh, Human Rights Council, uh, where where there's a lot of really great ideas and great research and knowledge within academia that can better inform some of these discussions. Uh, so thanks for that contribution. Next point, I'll go to uh, Francesca, please go ahead. Thank you, Will. So um, the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute engages the global legal profession. So the lawyers, judges, and prosecutors. So with human rights mechanisms, including, of course, the UPR. We do so because the separation of powers and uh, the independence of the judiciary constitute the building blocks for the rule of law and democracy. And for this reason, justice, we believe that justice actors and those working in the justice system should deserve a special attention dedicated attention. They are pivotal to ensure access to justice, for example, the right to redress accountability, combat impunity, and promote law reform. So this goes in line with the SDG 
16. Uh, so the, the UPR in this is a unique space, of course, so to engage with the legal community because it has created an unprecedented framework of national engagement and dialogue among all stakeholders that can lead to important advances. Um, and this can also be applied to justice actors. So, so far, unfortunately, we have observed that the legal community have engaged poorly with, the, with human rights monitoring. For example, when in, in February 2015, uh, Ibari organized a meeting in Myanmar with 16 independent lawyers to discuss the UPR, and only two out of 60 participants had heard about the UPR process. Um, so we, there we see a potential for all the legal professions to engage, better engage with the UPR. Just more quickly and more specifically, prior to the review, the body operates on two different fronts. One is to help foster the dialogue between states and the legal community by engaging lawyers and judges uh, in national consultations and in the reporting process. So really feeding into the uh, reporting process by referring to, for example, to legal barriers or illegal vacuums, re relevant landmark cases of the highest judicial instances. For example, in Brazil for the 2015 uh, UPR, representatives from the Supreme Court took part in the public hearing organized by the state, and as a result, landmark human rights decisions by the federal Supreme Court were then taken, we included into the presentation of the national report. The second part is that we reach legal community with the, the civil society organizations and we try to then uh, contribute to enhance the quantity but also the quality of the recommendations that are related to the administration of justice. Thank you, over to you. Thanks Francesca. I think there was a lot of really interesting points you touched on which and two minutes is, is a lot tougher than you think. Uh, uh, one point, awareness raising about the, the uh, lawyers in Myanmar not knowing about the UPR process, but then advocating for why, you know, they why this is important for them and how they can use it, monitoring these these uh, examples uh, and instances in the UPR process, and then and sort of providing a bit of that research analysis and support to then carry out this role a bit better and be more involved. So it's a lot of these functions that that I, I mentioned earlier are, are very much present in what you were uh, discussing. Unfortunately, we are running short on time and I wanna be able to get to the VNR side of things. So I'll give Marina, you get the uh, the last comment before we switch to the, the VNR side of things in this pre-review stage. So go ahead, Marina. Thanks so much, Will, and thanks everyone for contributing. Um, and I guess I maybe help transition a little bit into the VNR process as well. Uh, one point that I wanted to raise is that Geneva Spaces have been known for providing advocates of uh, peace building, sustaining peace, a platform for accountability that does not certainly exist at the New York level, right? And this is an important process and UPR has been uh, part of this process for a long time. And I just wanna commend UPR Info for the work that they have done previously with Quaker UN office um, and Geneva office of Quakers uh, where they produced a paper on how peace building actors have used UPR to advocate for certain things, supporting peace process in Colombia, in Syria, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing that is important to note, and I wanted to pass it to my colleague Patrick, if possible or when possible, will to also share a little bit about the fact that the purposes is important, right? And UPR will not always be the right platform for peace builders to engage, right? Because sometimes you cannot hold government accountable. You wanna be in dialogue, you wanna be in negotiation. UPR always has this accountability sense to it, right? It's more concrete, yes, but it's also not always a solution to everyone's problems because sometimes you wanna engage with the government and you wanna engage with them on the uh, really grassroots, less accountability and more practice-based level. So uh, whenever there is a chance, if uh, Pachi can share his story from Uganda on how they have done it, I think that would be illustration to what I'm saying. Thank you. Yeah, Patrick, if you could keep your remarks very brief, uh, but, but jump in in just a second, and then we'll give Johnny uh, 30 seconds uh, after, after you, Patrick. So please go ahead, Patrick. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Uganda. Uh, just to build on what Marina said, uh, ours is more on the VNR process. 
And what we did was to start by conducting uh, a comprehensive study on Uganda's progress uh, on SDG 16. As we are all aware, uh, the VNR process is uh, always often uh, state-led. And uh, so there is, you would say, less room for civil society organizations, but we had to claim that space and a few opportunities that were there. Uh, so what we did was to have this study such that we are able to promote inclusiveness and participation by collecting uh, the voices of the community and the realities on the, uh, from the community. So what we did was to engage with the government because we worked uh, on the roadmap of the government such that our findings contribute and feed into the uh, VNR process. And then after that, of course, it gave us um, an opportunity to start engaging directly. And after the presentation of the report to the high level political forum, we continued with that engagement, giving us like more opportunity to connect with the government, to work together. And also now we are, clo are closely or jointly advocating together on key issues that were uh, in the report, for example, SDG localization, prioritization of peace and the uh, conflict prevention, and also uh, uh, building awareness on the localization guide, which we are trying to pilot in one of the, the districts. And this has created a basis for uh, networking, working jointly, and also creating more awareness. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick, uh, and especially for that little teaser on what's going to come on the VNRs. Johnny, uh, please, uh, if you would like to jump. Thank you, Will. Just about to, to go to the review of Hungary, wanted to say I've shared some links. There is a great deal that the advocacy of civil society and national human rights institution can do to facilitate implementation, especially of recommendations that are accepted by the state and that can increasingly be fully integrated with the work at the SEG at country level. The more we are able to get that done with the support of different entities and partners, the more we will actually realize what you mentioned at the beginning, a Kofi Annan point, that uh, peace, security, development, and the human rights go hand in hand. The more we implement UPR recommendations, the more we address root causes, the more we reduce gaps in implementation, strengthen national protection system, and therefore enhance prevention and eventually reduce humanitarian crisis, conflict, and enhance peace. Over to you. Thank you. Great remarks, Johnny. And thanks again for joining us. I know you have to leave quite soon uh, for another meeting. And those were uh, great remarks to sort of leave on uh, and to reiterate the, the points that this is ultimately all linked back to peace. You know, human rights is fundamentally part of peace. Without human rights, you don't have peace. And without peace, you don't have human rights as well. Um, uh, so that will bring us to then the, the VNR side of things. Um, so we had a little bit of a teaser, uh, still not nearly enough time to get to it. But uh, uh, maybe we could hear from some of the VNR experts around the table here about um, about how has civil society been able to engage and perhaps maybe influence the agenda for the uh, VNR process maybe before a state is committed? Have they been able to maybe alter the agenda or sort of maybe control, maybe get some different, uh, different perspectives included in the review, the eventual review that came? Um, uh, John, maybe uh, do you have any sort of examples off the top of your head about how you've worked some members of your network or other organizations that have been able to sort of uh, contribute to the VNR process maybe before a state had sort of pledged to commit to a VNR? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, there are many examples to, to showcase, but I think, you know, on the point that has been made before. I think um, you know the VNR process is quite. Uh, I've heard the term used today and before. It is quite fluffy. Um, so I think it is really incumbent on uh, governments, but also civil society uh, in the countries that are volunteering for a VNR in a given year, um, to really up the ambition level. I mean, uh, VNRs I think are seen as uh, largely by governments as reporting 
uh, on what they've done. And in many cases, it's just reporting on the good things that are happening in, the, in that particular country. Um, and I think that's one of the shortcomings. I think one of the criticisms of the process itself and, and uh, related to follow up um, is that it's also just completely government centric. So uh, as we saw from the quiz earlier, governments are encouraged to engage with civil society and other stakeholders in, in the VNR process, but in many cases that just doesn't happen. So um, I think it's, it's tough to say, you know, uh, what we should do in every, in every case because it's a voluntary process. Uh, but I do think that one important thing that we should be uh, talking about is on spotlight reporting. So, you know, because, um, you know, we've obviously we've learned that uh, the VNR process has a dedicated uh, way for civil society to contribute to the process. I think spotlight reporting is, a, is kind of a, one of those missing links for the, uh, the VNR process where civil society can report uh, on a government or, or a given country's um, status, I mean, from elevating it to the level of a VNR, or at least having a conversation at the HLPF uh, through the VNR process, you know, what is the government telling us uh, we, where we are in progress? Where is civil society and other stakeholders telling us? And then bringing those colleagues um, and those reports together to actually have a genuine conversation on where we are. And then what do we do about it? If there are shortcomings, that's okay. Where do we go from here? Um, and I think that's, again, one of the, the missing links here that we, uh, there's not just no entry point for spotlight reporting, but there's not even a platform to collect these reports. Um, so I think that's a, a role that civil society can, can play. There's a lot more to unpack on, on this, but um, I think spotlight reporting could be a, are a big way that um, civil society have contributed and can uh, in the VNR process going forward. Yeah, thanks, John. It's, it's a really important point and it's one, you know, I think, developing almost a parallel system that complements and enhances the quality of the, the VNR system that exists within the SDGs. Uh, it's uh, largely due to the inadequacy of the system, whereas maybe with the UPR process, you have, you know, elements that you can work with and improve and, and build on. But maybe it's interesting that within the VNRs, there's sort of this idea of you know, making another system because the system you have doesn't allow access in the same way. Um, uh, Liv, I have you next on my uh, list of speakers. Could you please go? Thank you so much. Good to see everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, let me start by basically asking the question of why we are doing these reviews. And I think you know, the, the aim here is not to do reviews. The aim here is to have tools, i.e. reviews, that can make us and help us uh, track progress, identify where the holes are when it comes to implementation. It's a tool. And, and I think we, when we have that perspective, a lot of John's comments on, on the VNRs and the SDGs are, are very important, I think. Uh, we, on the Pathfinder side, are I'm running the secretariat at NYU CIC of a big coalition working on about 40 countries with civil society partners, IFIs, et cetera, working on peace, justice, and inclusion. And the, I think, important two points to raise here in this discussion is the role we have and civil society has when it comes to awareness raising and when it comes to providing reliable information and data. Both are important for the VNR processes before they start, under and after. So we are doing that on all the sort of peace, justice and inclusion side. Uh, we focus on providing reliable information. We provide uh, assistance to countries uh, who ask for help with the VNRs, etc. We have had discussions on VNRs um, and how to structure them, etc. But I return to my, my initial point, which is that you know, 
the VNRs are very, very, very different. Some are relatively good. A lot of them are not only packed with, as John said, what they are doing in each and one area, but good intentions. We think peace is important. We think violence reduction is important. Justice is important. And we need to structure them more, improve them and strengthen them in order to make them tools for tracking progress and tools for actually identifying where the holes are and how we can address them. So the UPR process to me sounded much more useful in, in that respect than the VNRs. Sorry, and thank you. Thanks, excellent contribution. Uh, Peter, I have you next on the list, please. Thanks, Will, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, allow me to make a, a few few comments uh, from the point of the civil society platform for peace building and state building. We have been supporting countries, uh, predominantly in fragile and conflict affected settings, in their VNR process. And I want to go back to the before stage. Uh, what we see happening in the countries that embark on a review process that the moment the environment for civil society and other stakeholder engagement is more conducive, the better this inclusivity can be safeguarded and can be promoted in the process. And that is what we have been doing, utilizing our entry points through the International Dialogue on Peace Building and State Building, to which we have direct connections with government stakeholders, but also with, with international donors supporting that process as an entry point and as a segue uh, for getting civil society participation secured and included in the process. The reason for doing that is also going back to the preamble of the 2030 agenda. Although the VNR process is a government-led process, it is a multi-stakeholder endeavor in which we are in. I mean, it's not only governments who are supposed to be making progress on this agenda. It's a multi-actor process where civil society and other stakeholders are as much actor in the process and have to report also on their process and on their progress in the context of the VNR. So to me, it's, it's a given that it should be an inclusive and an all-encompassing process. The reality, however, is different indeed. I mean, those countries where civic space is not uh, shrinking and where civic space is not against the participation of civil society, we can make that participation and involvement of civil society happen. But in those countries where the governments are restrictive, they might also not want to knock on the doors of civil society and invite them to be part of this process. So I think that is a crucial issue that put on the table uh, that, that it is supposed to be a multi-actor um, 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 whole of society review of where the country stands with a uh, SDG implementation process. But often the government takes a different lens uh, to approaching a VNR process in, in that sense. So that is that is something which we try to tackle in that. Oh, exactly on the, on the gong, please. Perfect the timing, evening. yeah, great job, Peter. Uh, yeah, and it's a really uh, important point about that while the VNRs is a state-led process, there is this it does call for a sort of inclusive multi-stakeholder process from civil society, but also business and, and other sectors as well. Um, and so it shouldn't be dismissed that there is this role to play, even though it just may be a, there may be a few more obstacles in the way to for civil society's voice to be heard. Um, I'll move next to Louise and then Louise after that, uh, Karen, I'll ask you to, to jump in. So Louise, go ahead. Uh, thanks. And thanks everyone. Um, I just want to share some of the experiences that we had in South Africa, reflecting off my brother from Uganda and how jealous I was to hear about some of the initiatives there. But like Uganda, South African civil society really had to claim the space. But the claiming of the space became, uh, to me, a very tiered process. It, it was either a process which in which you could engage if you're a civil society organization operating at a technical level, but certainly one that has not been opened nor um, uh, the space kind of created for community based representativity, which is that Ugandan example of of your organization um, going down to the community level 
gathering the voices, um, the concerns and the data from the communities and taking it to state. And what we didn't have here was that in South Africa. And I think that was largely because the government made a decision to have as the custodian for the indicated development and then the subsequent country reporting in the VNR, the Statistics South Africa, not the departments, um, other departments that have traditionally been more involved in this type of international reporting. And so they became very fixated on data sources. So it had to be meet particular criteria. And we're really losing the voice and the experiences and the kind of the nuances that are required to help us to really understand and um, I think have meaningful measures uh, towards achieving 16 and, and, and 11 as well. Um, because as you're probably all aware, South Africa has got quite well-developed um, uh, sectors that are doing an enormous amount of work around justice, safety and development. But, but seeing that reflected um, becomes the work very much of those of us working at the technical level with the indicator development, et cetera, and not so much about community voices. Um, yeah, so I'd be keen to know and understand more about how UPR processes um, sort of invite this and create that environment uh, so that we in the VNR side could, could learn a bit about that. Great question, Louise. And I, and after Karen, we'll, we'll move into a bit of that discussion. And I'm hoping some, some of you from the UPR world will have some insight into that. So please, Karen, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just to be able to say and add to the conversation that, of course, both uh, the process in UPR and the VNRs really uh, begin and end at home. And that's always the case. But as a national human rights institution, um, we help bridge and we act as monitors of government, but we do help bridge the concerns of civil society um, uh, to government and vice versa. And what's important as well is um, perhaps, again, uh, just, just to amplify that point earlier, that the strength of the UPR is really the space that is already there, evident for civil society, for national human rights institutions to be able to participate. No? Um, uh, but uh, in the VNRs, again, it is state driven, but one of the things that is good going for VNRs is that there is also great um, uh, acceptance of government when it comes to including this in uh, development and investment plans of government. And that's where the convergence comes in as well. But of course, having said that, it's also difficult because like for instance, in the various cycles of the UPR um, uh, and also in the reporting in the SDGs, we've found that there has been a change in conditions in the Philippines. So as um, uh, uh, we have been saying that there is shrinking civic space and all that. So it depends really on the openness also of government to be able to um, allow all the stakeholders to participate at the national level. And that's what gives the UPR, the competitive advantage um, uh, as a mechanism. And that's that's one thing that uh, I wanted to emphasize. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. And, and for a great reminder that NHRIs also have a really important role in both of these processes, as you mentioned, to sort of bridge this, this gap in, in maybe in the sustainable development reporting mechanisms uh, between civil society and this sort of state-led process where you have NHRIs, which are state institutions, but have often have built in sort of civil society representation in, in, in the bodies. Uh, and so uh, it's it's a really important point and that NHRIs are great allies in the in both of these processes. Um, uh, another point that maybe I'll come back to so we can shift back to then the UPR process. Uh, if, if you have any comments on how do CSOs feed into the national reviews of the UPR process, because I think not many of us from the VNR side totally uh, understand that, but if, if you could also maybe address Louise's uh, sort of comments about the sort of getting lost in maybe all of the data and metrics and all of that and losing sight of the bigger picture, but also um, uh, the point that Karen and, and, um, and uh, Peter have mentioned about the sort of in, in countries where there's maybe a lack of a shrinking civic space or a sort of widespread sort of, uh, yeah, uh, 
there isn't a, a conducive environment for civil society to be consulted by the government. How does that work within the, v the UPR process? So threw a bunch of these questions out there. Maybe uh, I'll let you all sort of uh, jump in to do this, but I see Damien, you've raised your hand first. Please go ahead, Damien. Um, thank you very much, um, Will, um, for also inviting me to this um, roundtable discussion. And it's really great to, to meet so many stakeholders in the UPL process um, here and to learn a lot about the VNL um, um, process. And it's uh, really good to see you as well, um, Alice. Um, so I think um, my work, um, mostly research-wise, has focused a lot on understanding the impact of the UPR in um, different African countries. Um, and I think I have um, kind of looked closely at the um, participation of civil society and how it actually informs several stages of the UPR process. Um, and at the, um, um, the, the one of the stages, uh, that we, we, we started discussing on the national consultation process has been one of the ways in which um, civil societies have kind of engaged in the process. Um, and one of the, the ways they have navigated some challenging civic spaces um, has been to, to form coalitions. I think um, what my research has found is uh, that um, the, those civil society organizations that have been able to establish national coalitions on the UPR have had greater impact in terms of engaging the government, um, both proactively, but also in the follow up stages uh, of the review. Uh, but also for those um, um, countries where um, civil society space is kind of difficult to exercise, they formed coalitions with um, international NGOs in order to get the message um, about um, the civic space and other human rights issues out into the UPR. Um, process, um, but also one other way in which they can, um, um, from my my research, they can inform other play, uh, other stages of the UPR, especially the. Um, um, the, the the review process itself in, in Geneva is to also um, be able to um, liaise and um, kind of lobby um, other state delegates um, who kind of make those recommendations. And I think um, they can help to ensure that the recommendations that states make um, kind of inform the process and are relevant to the human rights issues that they face on the ground. Um, and some of the challenges, um, there has been some states make recommendations in the process which are not kind of relevant to the human rights situation on the ground. And um, one of the ways um, NGOs can really ensure that they kind of inform that process is to be able to um, lobby state delegates um, who make those recommendations. So I'll end there for now, Will, and perhaps um, kind of contribute later on. Um, yeah, yeah. This well, I think we'll we'll get be able to get back to it. Uh, uh, and a lot of interesting points. One, you mentioned about the coalitions. Uh, I think it's a really interesting sort of common lesson between both the UPRs and the VNRs, because I know John, Peter, uh, uh, Marina all come from TAP Network, CSPPS, and GPAC, which are these coalitions of like-minded civil society organizations to sort of amplify their message through this sort of coalition. So interesting that it's a similar thing within the UPR process. Uh, next, uh, Karen, maybe could you jump in and share your comments on this? Thank you, Will. Um, uh, just uh, shortly, no? Um... Of course, there are um, uh, sessions, learning sessions about UPR, but uh, one of the things that I'd like to share is really a strategy session that we've always had with uh, civil, civil society. And uh, one of the practical ways by which we are doing this is because of course we're uh, an A status NHRI and we would get a good amount of space in the stakeholders information, the summary. So what we would do is, um, bring together everyone on the table and try to just um, uh, navigate how, what certain issues we need to amplify, but what other issues would be best raised by civil society and what issues would be best raised by, by the Commission on Human Rights as well. And this has worked for the most part in the UPR because of certain constraints in terms of number of pages for submissions and all that. No? But having said that also, we have also gathered and mapped all the stakeholders at the national level. And that includes, of course, the lobbying that we have heard earlier on. And we start the lobbying process here um, uh, in the Philippines by gathering our um, uh, uh, the diplomatic core and raising those issues um, 
giving them a briefer of uh, national, human, national human rights situations so that they can pick up from uh, issues that we want them to be able to raise in the UPR process. And that has worked so far in the three cycles that we've been in, uh, in the UPR. That's all, thank you. Thanks, Karen. Next, uh, I have Alice. Please go ahead, Alice. Thank you. Um, my comment was going to address Louise's question actually about getting lost in the data and um, trying to see the bigger picture. Um, and I think um, from my own experience, a good way of this and finding out what civil society find to be the real issues um, is by getting involved in, from the UPR side, um, the pre-sessions which are led by UPR Info. Um, and so uh, although they are technically not an official part of the UPR, they are uh, well attended by uh, member state delegations, et cetera. Um, so a few weeks before um, the review of each country, um, UPR Info puts together a panel of civil society um, uh, representatives uh, that will deliver a short statement um, about the issues they would like member states to raise during the UPR and make recommendations on. Um, and also you can have a dialogue and it is a really good way actually of starting a dialogue with member state delegations either in the pre-session or um, I've had success by having email conversations um, with member state delegations and um, explaining, you know, th these are the important issues that I think need to be raised um, during the UPR. Um, and we've had some success with this. Um, so from the stakeholder report and the engagement um, in the pre-session, um, uh, I led on a report that was submitted to Namibia's UPR. Um, about women and girls with HIV. Um, and in, in the previous cycle, no member states had made any recommendations specifically about women and girls with HIV. After our um, involvement in the pre-sessions and um, the submission of the stakeholder report, we saw in cycle three um, that three recommendations were made specifically on women and girls with HIV. So we're seeing some traction in getting involved in this process and having a dialogue directly with the member states. Um, and because of COVID, they've been online, which is helpful because more uh, CSOs can get involved. They don't have to travel um, to Geneva, et cetera. Um, and maybe the VNRs could look at doing something similar, something more formal like the pre-sessions. Yeah, great, thanks. And maybe this is a point that uh, someone from the, the VNR side can pick up on about this sort of pre-session thing. I know that that uh, many of you guys present have sort of done similar things where, where you've done civil society statements before, before the HLPF to sort of try and influence the agenda on that. So in we'll come back to that in just a minute. So if one of you guys wants to chime in on, on some of these efforts you've done to also sort of raise awareness before these things. But I'll give one last remark to Miloon before we come back to the VNRs. So, uh, or I'm sorry, actually after that, we'll have Mona also contribute because Mona, you haven't had a chance to speak yet. So Miloon, please. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, we have been speaking all this time almost as if, uh, these are sort of parallel processes, the SDG and the UPR work, and it's almost like a competitive thing. Uh, I, I think we should really be working on merging the two. And, and the way in which we've been doing it from the UPR side is in all the training work, uh, we always make sure that each UPR recommendation is linked to the relevant uh, SDG. And, uh, and also, you know, in, in all the training work with the governments also, we found sometimes it's easier to go in with the SDGs. So I, I think we should really spend some minutes on how do we bring the work together. And quickly to answer the question on um, why has the UPR reached out more? I think it's also because there's been a lot of training work done at the local level, not only in the capital, but also in the regional areas. And the training work has, has involved the local community in drafting the recommendations um, that were being mentioned uh, that go up to the UPR. And so there's a, the, the, the local communities have a stake in that. And both, also because the process is transparent and webcast and all that also, that also helps. So I, I, think, I think it's really important for us to move away from this two stage process and, let, and spend some time on how do we merge, merge the two not only you know in terms of uh, 
training and mechanisms and all that, but also in terms of working together at the national level. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mamoon. That's a really great point and one I want to definitely sort of, I was planning to wrap up with, but maybe we need to talk about it now. Uh, but Mona, if you have any comments on this or, or some other points, please, please go ahead. Yes, I can compliment what has been said. Just want to say that really the civil society participation is really embedded in, in the UPR for the reporting, but also uh, for the advocacy work, as uh, Alice was mentioning, uh, civil society do advocate with recommending states to ensure that really the voice of the right holders and grassroots organization, uh, really different voice of the civil society is heard during the UPR. So they really have a chance really to, to shape the human rights agenda of, of the countries. And one of the really very positive impact of the UPR that we saw is that really the voice of vulnerable group, marginalized group has been really raised up Thanks to the UPR, we saw much more recommendation raised on LGBTQR, which led to better protection on persons with disability, on indigenous people. So it's really one of really very positive impact that the UPR had. Um, and the point related to the SDGs and UPR, we can see also more uh, recommending state, in fact, linking, in fact, their recommendation. Uh, to specific goals and target of SDGs. And for instance, Netherlands is one of, of the champions doing that. And also state, in fact, uh, on civil society participation, in fact, two points. This is part of the UPR that states are required, in fact, to conduct a consultation and to listen up to, to civil society's actors before drafting the report. And in the follow-up also to draft the roadmap and the National Human Rights Action Plan, it's, there's also a part of consultation of the civil society to hear the voice and to see how they can you know, contribute and support the implementation of the UPR. Uh, recommendation and part of this action plan is often linked now with the SDG to see how the UPR recommendation contribute to the achievement of the SDGs. So very briefly, <laughs> given the time. Yeah, thanks, Mona, for for that intervention. Maybe uh, I'll uh, ask those from the VNR world. Uh, do you, how can you sort of link up with with this UPR process? I think we've all seen how. Uh, how there's been sort of shortcomings within, you know, different perspectives not being incorporated into the voluntary national reviews. But is there a way for some of this information to be fed to the UPR process and have these these recommendations sort of actually res responded to? Have have you ever engaged with this process before? Uh, and do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I'll, I'll give Liv a chance to, to jump in. I know you have to leave a little bit early. So please go ahead, Liv. Thank you. And and I wasn't going to comment specifically on the UPRs, but, but more of a broader comment on awareness raising, etc. So I'll just return briefly to the UPRs at the very end. But you know, I do think this awareness raising and, and putting spotlight on the need for uh, progress report, monitoring, etc i.e. the VNRs and UPRs is a crucial, crucially important thing to do from civil society and, and broader actors, let me put it like that. So we did Pathfinder, we've done Pathfinder statements on the SDG 16 plus, we've col collaborated with the SDG 16 plus coalition on statements and awareness raising. Uh, we've done, we've helped the coalition of pathfinder countries with statements before the HLPF and again, as I said previously, help on, on the VNRs. But I do think things like the annual report that we started doing this year for the HLPF on the state of peace, justice and inclusion is an important example of things that also civil society can do. And maybe some of this broader civil society organizations should do together, like a sort of shadow report on the side of the VNRs, where broad groups and organizations collaborate and, and make it a powerful, uh, awareness raising and information sharing tool. 
Let me just add one other thing on information and data, which is, I think, an important role that civil society has to provide that. Uh, that's not only, uh, we're not only talking about providing relevant updated information, but I also think that pushing indicators and new indicators like we did on the justice side uh, from the pathfinders and the task force on justice is, is an important piece of work as well. We need to agree on some indicator, indicators to track progress. Now, maybe a good thing from civil society side on the national level would be to collaborate around the UPRs and the VNRs. Uh, I think more importantly, it would be a good thing to, to collaborate on shadow reports and indicators and data, actually, and not the least. Uh, combining muscles in order to push delivery on the ground, which these reports are meant to, to actually help us deliver. Thank you. Thanks, Liv. Uh, and it's a, a great point that uh, we we're talking about coalitions within our own sectors, but why not coalitions that transcend sectors, even though they all we're all working towards the same objectives. Um, before I go to those that have indicated they want to speak, I want to give a chance to John Roberts or uh, or Mary Ajeli Narti. I know you guys haven't had a chance, or John Robert, I had to cut you off uh, because of your connection. But if you want to uh, say something, uh, I know, uh, please click the raise hand button and I'll, I'll give you the floor or unmute your mic. But if if not, um, I'll then... Uh, uh, sorry, if I, I, I have been advised to really put my camera off. Uh, I hope that my network will be quite fine. Yeah. Uh, but I want to thank Will, you're doing a good job. Yes, I want to contribute uh, about the issue of shrinking space, uh, uh, civic space. It is true, uh, my sister from Philippines talked about that challenge of uh, shrinking civic space. It is true, even here in Uganda, we are having the same challenge because uh, uh, you find that uh, as we reach out to the communities, to the grassroots human rights defenders, uh, there's always that kind of pushback by the state uh, in a way of trying to, you know, uh, think that you're mobilizing people because the freedom of uh, association and the freedom of assembly and the civic space is provided for in the constitution, but when there is that kind of mobilization, then there's always that kind of pushback by the state. But also the issue of the VNR, which is largely uh, voluntary and, 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 and really state-led. Like here in Uganda, we have a coalition for sustainable development goals. But you find that at the end of the day, basically we are working from scratch. You're reaching out, you're trying to reach out. But of course, it is not every day that the state will be very cooperative. But you can see that there should be a relationship a, a deliberate relationship between the VNR and the UPR, because as we said, for example, look at SDG 16, it is very clear that uh, the, 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 the principle they are in is establishing a peaceful society. We cannot have peace where there are no human rights. So there's a very close relationship uh, will and dear participants. So for me, I think going forward, I think uh, the, 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 we, I encourage and that all states must be cooperative. They must be able to uh, work together with civil society because civil society, we are not enemies of the state. We are key stakeholders and we are trying to voice out the voices of the people, the ordinary people, especially the, uh, you know, the vulnerable and the you know, people who don't have voices. That's the role of the civil society. And I think going forward, we need to have more engagements with government, with, the, with all the stakeholders in, this, in the communities to ensure that the VNR achieves its purpose as we also push for uh, the EPR process. Thank you so much, Weir. Thanks, John Robert, for those great remarks. And yeah, I fully agree with uh, that they are intrinsically linked and they aren't separate, as also um, I believe Miloun mentioned, that they shouldn't be separate processes, but often we're maybe stuck in our own sort of uh, sector to not realize these broader processes that are also looking for the same objective. Uh, I'll give Mary um, a, a chance to, to yes. jump in next, and then I'll go to, to John. Mary, please. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I must say that Shraj, as a human rights institution, we are
I think you've dropped out, Mary. Maybe you could try turning your camera off so that the the, the sound quality is a little bit better. But uh, we'll come back to you in a minute once your um, connection is a bit more stable. So John, please uh, go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, on the point, um, you know, about, uh, you know, how do we link up between uh, the VNR and UPR processes? I mean, I think one of the, one of the complaints or uh, criticisms that we always get from governments about VNR reporting, um, especially because it's voluntary, is, uh, is about the reporting burden. And, you know, uh, governments are expected to report on- Yeah, and I think I had- Go ahead, John. We'll, we'll come back to Mary in just a minute. Okay. Um, so there's, you know, governments often complain about this okay. reporting burden. Um, you know, they're expected to report to the UPR and on the human rights uh, mechanisms. I think if we can, you know, as much as we can do within civil society to, um, you know, encourage governments to bring some of that content or the reporting from the human rights mechanisms onto the, uh, the VNRs, I think the argument uh, is is not really a, a relevant uh, point, but also the same can be said for civil society. I think we are often critical of governments of um, you know uh, being siloed, and and I think we are often uh, just as guilty of this. So I think bridging those these communities a lot better, um, you know, we can do a lot better job of that going forward. Um, but I think also one thing that we see, and, and one thing we can learn from the UPR process, I think. Um, is that governments often see spotlight reports as um, negative or, you know, critical, or that the spotlight reports are going to be critical. Um, and I think that's often not really the case. Um, so how do we shape the narrative that spotlight reports can be productive, that they can be positive? You know, I think oftentimes when civil society feels like they haven't been included in the VNR process, maybe that's when um, the spotlight reports tend to be a little bit more negative. Um, but yeah, how do we shape that narrative? And I think we can learn a lot uh, from UPR colleagues that have done reporting for many years, shadow reporting. Um, you know, how do we, again, shape, shape the narrative that reports are productive, that they provide insights, uh, that they connect experiences um, with grassroots communities that governments often struggle to reach and include. So um, I think, uh, yeah, a lot to learn from the UPR process and, and really look forward to uh, continuing those uh, conversations and, and future dialogues like like this. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, and I totally want to echo your your last point uh, that that this is really just a sort of exercise to identify some of these entry points that are worth having more detailed conversations. And we hope this conversation will continue on beyond this event. Uh, but I want to give the Mary a chance to to speak again, please, Mary. Um, could you jump in? Oh, thank you. As, as I was saying, as a human rights institution, we have been in the forefront helping the states uh, in the area of reporting and identifying the key indicators. However, I must say that coming next year, the fact that we will be reporting, we have a, a multi-sector or sectorial working group Obviously, without the NGO represented, I see that as a lacuna here because they're supposed to be part of the process so that they will also make their input despite their shadow reporting. Even though we also do shadow reporting, yet we are part of the working group. Also, we have also collaborated with the Ghana Statistical Service to monitor the implementation of the SDG, gather data to disaggregate them to help us uh, prepare the report in a manner that will reflect both the SDGs and the and the UPR reporting system. So my my suggestion would be, I see an issue of a lack of capacity on the part of some of the state institutions on how to actually gather information and gather data throughout the period to report meaningfully and practically. And so I would suggest a, a process because as I'm on this platform, I was expecting that the state institution responsible for reporting, which is the attorney general's department is not represented here. They're supposed to be part to understand the process 
Otherwise, it puts the pressure much on us to do the whole work, even for them, because they are not well informed on how to go about it. So this will be my submission. We are collaborating, we are gathering information on the SDGs so that it will shape our reporting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary, for those comments. And I think it's, so, yeah, I think we see uh, a lot of these same issues across both sectors as well. It relates back to, I think, Francesca's remark in Myanmar, the, a lack of understanding and awareness of how to engage with this material. Uh, it's now three o'clock, uh, at least in my time, uh, which is the end, but I will uh, also make use of my moderator privileges to extend this an additional 10 minutes so we can get a few of these last remarks in and then some wrap up remarks. Uh, thanks to everyone who has made it this far. And uh, I'm especially grateful if you'll you'll indulge an additional 10 minutes. Uh, but I'd like to sort of wrap this up and get these last two comments from Patrick and Peter before we before we draw some of the final conclusions. So uh, Patrick, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. I just want to add on what my colleague said, just to appreciate that the most important thing here is to appreciate the, the linkage and the complementarity between um, the v VNR and uh, UPR process. I think we need to start <clears throat> in, uh, looking at how do we enhance the collaboration more uh, looking forward. <clears throat> and also looking at uh, the, v the VNR, I think we, we realize that we don't have much inclusion and participation at, as uh, we, we should have. So we should not only depend on the goodwill of the government, uh, I think there should be a clear framework for engaging CSOs and other stakeholders. Of course, we have had um, creative ways of uh, kind of tapping into the global spaces like uh, last year, uh, the voices of SDG 16, which Peter and uh, uh, John know more about. about. So, and we, we tapped into the, also the space of uh, GPAC to make, create awareness across the, uh, the globe. So that was helpful. Uh, but lastly, I think we also need to look at the end objective of, of all these frameworks, whether uh, uh, the VNR or the UPR. At the end of the day, we need to see meaningful change in the lives of the people. And here, uh, I, I, I think uh, localization of whether VNR or UPR is very important such that we see impact on the ground, we see participation, we see uh, inclusiveness, we see ownership and implementation of these processes on the ground. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick, for that insight. I think it's it's completely, it's the most important thing that, that all of these report, these processes and mechanisms and rules and procedures ultimately sort of improve the lives of the people that it's meant to protect. We, we shouldn't lose sight of the, the fact that this is, uh, you know, get lost in all of these mechanisms and re reports and different things. Uh, this is meant to improve the human rights and sustainable development and uh, peaceful living conditions of all people involved. Uh, Peter, maybe I'll give you the last uh, comment from our panel of experts. Thank you, Will, and, and uh, difficult to, uh, to add something to what Patrick said, because I had similar points as, as my closing points. I think it's important to, to focus on the content and, and the purpose of why a review is being embarked upon, and, and that is indeed to make progress on the agenda and to ensure that whatever is being put in a review document is then also subsequently something is done with it so that it's enacted upon and that it leads to either a national planning document or a review of the national planning or indeed uh, policies are put in place that will follow up on those on those uh, review findings um, allow me also to make one point on reporting burden um, i mean the colleague john mentioned that that governments are um, shying away from these reports because of it it, it is difficult and it, uh, it, it involves work it's important in, in consultations with the government to actually also bring that element of, I mean, it's voluntary report, but the review is also presented in New York with a purpose 
to learn from the report and to um, open yourself as a government or as a country to say, okay, this is where we are at the stage of SDG implementation. And we like to learn from others and cross-fertilize experiences. And that purpose is also not sufficiently uh, um, embarked upon, I think. I mean, what John earlier said also, I mean, countries report a very rosy picture in New York are not critical of themselves or the status of implementation. And the review process should also be a critical moment to take stock of where things are and then subsequently, okay, what do, do we need to do better to serve the purposes of the agenda, um, making an, an impact on, on people on the ground? Over to you. Thanks, Peter. Those are some excellent final words to sort of wrap up this. Uh, you talked about we should be doing these reports and all of these, all of these mechanisms so that something is done with it. I hope that that's also a lesson for this event. It shouldn't just be a one-off event. I hope we can continue having discussions like these uh, and, and, and find practical entry points at which we can continue to follow up on. So this wasn't, isn't a one-off discussion. And I invite all of you uh, in this expert panel, but also those of you in attendance who unfortunately haven't had a chance to really engage as much as we would like um, to reach out to me. Uh, my name or my email is w.mcdermott. So like Will McDermott, you can see in my name, w.mcdermott at decaf.ch if you would like to get involved. And I'll be following up with all of you on this panel to make sure that um, uh, uh, it, to see if you would like to continue having discussions like these and perhaps uh, a little bit more focused than the broad panel we had today. Um, uh, another point you mentioned, Peter, was about uh, that these reports are learning experiences. Um, I think uh, this event was also a learning experience. I see that there is a lot of potential. Uh, Miloon, you mentioned that we shouldn't see these these two as competitive or even like parallel sessions, but they're 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 the same process working towards the same objective, but on slightly sort of different subject matters, though ultimately have the sort of same end purpose, and that we should uh, sort of. Yeah, look at how we can build these synergies, how we can work together better um, on, on these different uh, mechanisms. And so I hope we can have more discussions like these in the very near future. Um, and uh, I know we are already over time, so I'll sort of try and abbreviate my final remarks. I just wanted to say thank you again to all of you uh, on the expert panel um, for, for your great remarks and your insights and for keeping excellently to the, the two minute uh, uh, limit that we sort of imposed on you. Uh, I thought it was a really great first discussion and I hope we can have more. I wanna thank all of you who've, who've stuck through it this long. Uh, I'm impressed to see how many of you are still here, uh, even though we've gone over time. Thank you for attending and thank you for sharing these resources. I see that the, uh, the chat has been very active during this, this panel and we've, we're keeping a record of all of the, the messages shared. And so we will be sure to follow up with you if you have raised any sort of specific questions. There's a ton of resources. We'll also collect those as well and share them as well. Uh, I want to also thank the Dutch Ministry on Foreign Affairs, importantly, who provided some of the financial resources to make sure that this event could happen. Um, uh, as uh, I believe Mona mentioned, they're, they're great champions on the UPR cause. They're also great champions on the SDG 16 cause um, as well. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to thank all of those who made this uh, event a reality. So Emma Hunt from Wafuna, Nicoletta Zapile from UPR Info, and both and their colleagues who also assisted with this importantly. And uh, my colleagues at DCAF, especially Merla Jasper, uh, Pedro uh, de Castro Souza, Alex Preparia and, Mon and Mona Lee Gibbs. Um, uh, we'd love to keep this conversation going. I saw my email was shared in the chat a, a few messages ago. Uh, please do take the opportunity to reach out to me if you have any questions or want to follow up on things. Um, and also, uh, there will be a participatory plenary uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock. I'm also the thematic, uh, thematic track lead for Geneva Peace Week's track on inequalities in SDG 16. So I'll be speaking with the Beyond Securitization track lead, and we'll be sharing some of the main themes that came about from all of these different events that have taken place over starting yesterday. Um, also, when you close this screen, uh, there will be a uh, sort of uh, conference uh, event survey 
that we also ask you to fill out. We want to know how how we did on this, what could have been done better, what could have been done differently, so that we can also learn from this and have another event like this that's even better next time. Uh, so please do fill that out, and uh, hopefully I'll be in touch with many of you in, in the near future. But uh, that's about it, and thanks again for joining, and uh, have a nice rest of your day.